Well, welcome. It is uh, one o'clock on March 4th. And um, welcome to the Northeastern IPM's uh, Spot Atlantic Blind Basics webinar. I'm Jana Hexter, and I work with the Northeastern IPM Center. And I am delighted to be here today with uh, five experts from around New York State uh, talking about spotted lanternflies for um, nursery plants and ornamentals. And uh, we have lots of time for Q&A today. We have a large group and uh, so I think some people are still filtering in. Um, so I will just talk for a couple of minutes with some basic housekeeping things to bear in mind before we dive in. So the first is this is being recorded, um, so you can come back and listen to it as many times as you like and be able to send the link to other people. Um, it'll take us about a week to uh, put the uh, recording up on the website and when that's ready I will send an email to you and anyone else who's registered for this, um, I'll send them the link. If you don't hear from me uh, probably by this time next week, please just shoot me an email. My name is Jana Hexter and uh, my name is all over different things associated with this webinar and I'd be happy to, uh, to see, look into it for you. Um, we love questions and uh, this is the fourth and final actually of our series that we've done. So we've had some great questions coming in. And uh, what we ask you to do is if you scroll your mouse over your screen, you'll see there's a black um, horizontal box that shows up. And then about in the middle of that, um, there's something that says Q&A. And if you click on there, you can ask a question. You can do that anonymously if you would like to. And, um, and so as the uh, webinar is happening, uh, please go in there and put your questions. We ask that you don't use the chat feature uh, for a couple of reasons. One is at the end of this, uh, we get a report with all of the questions and who asked the question. So um, if you ask something and one of the presenters wants to follow up with you next week that they've done a bit of research, have a different answer for you, they'll be able to easily look up that question and who asked it. And um, if you do that with, um, uh, if you do that with the chat, it's not as easy for us to, uh, to keep track of that. Um, and um, you can ask a question anonymously, so you don't have to worry about that. I am delighted to introduce our intrepid uh, presenters today. We have um, Elizabeth Lamb, who is the Ornamentals and IPM Coordinator with the New York State IPM Program. Brian Ashenauer, who's the Ornamentals IPM Specialist with the New York State IPM Program. Ethan Angel, who is the Senior Horticultural Inspector with the New York State Department of Ag and Markets. Dan Gilrain, who's the Extension Entomologist with Suffolk County Cooperative Extension. And Tim Weigel, who is the Grape and Hops IPM Specialist with the New York State IPM Program. And Tim actually put a lot of work into coordinating this and bringing people together and putting together this very beautiful presentation. So hats off to Tim for the work involved there. So the agenda today is we're going to talk about spotted lanternfly biology and identification, and then pathways and spread, monitoring and management, regulatory update, and we'll have lots of time for questions. We're going to stop about every 10 minutes uh, to answer your questions, so please feel free to post them all the way and we'll just stop when we have a, a, a good break. So before we dive into the content, we have some questions for you and um, you should see a poll up on your screen. And um, there are nine questions here um, and we'd like you to answer them to the best of your ability. If you have no clue, just randomly guess, it's totally fine. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is not to, to, to judge you, it's more to give us an idea of who is uh, on the call and, um, and also maybe to gauge um, differences between the beginning and the end. Of the, um, of the presentation. So I'm going to be quiet for a couple of minutes because to give you time to read through these and respond to them. And uh, just so you know, you have to select an answer for all of the questions before you can submit it. You can't skip a question. So if you're not sure, just guess. And I'll just uh, sit back and give you some time to do that.
And uh, we have 48% of you have voted so far, so I'm just going to wait for about 30 more seconds and then we'll close it up. Terrific. So we've uh, about 62% of you have voted so far. So um, if we can close up the poll, we'll be able to show you um, the responses that we have. And um, and there we can just uh, scroll down and uh, you'll be able to see the responses. And we're also going to look at this at the end and um, you'll be able to, uh, we'll give you the answers at the end. and. Um, so I see we have 40% of the people are only slightly knowledgeable and another 10% are not knowledgeable at all. So hopefully uh, we will shift uh, the needle on that a little bit during the call. And it uh, looks like there's uh, a debate about whether uh, fourth N star is uh, red with white spots or turns black with red spots. And we'll hopefully, we will find out the answer to that uh, in this presentation. And um, terrific. So um, we'll now move on to the presentation. And um, we, uh, we're going to have um, uh, Betsy Lamb, who's going to be talking about biology and identification. And for those people who couldn't see the questions online, or questions showing up, you might have to click on the polling box on the bottom. We had a couple hands up, and then a couple things turned up in questions that said they couldn't see the questions. So that's. Ah. That's my, I've had, I've had it happen where I had to click on the polling uh, button on the bottom bar to be able to see them. So, okay, okay. that's, oh, that's, that's really my high tech answers. Now I'll talk about something that maybe I know something about. <laughs> okay, <laughs> terrific. Thank you, as much as, as much as we all know about it. Um, so, hello, good morning, and it was good afternoon, sorry. Um, and oh. so, the, the spotted lantern fly is an invasive plant hopper. It's not a fly, it's not a moth. Many times you see the picture with the wings spread, and so it looks like a moth. And because it's a plant hopper, it's a good jumper. Um, most of us, we have lots of plant hoppers that are native, but they're often small and, um, but you do sometimes, can, sometimes know when they're there because you'll see them jump when you get close to them. This one's native to China and Vietnam, and it feeds on over 70 plant spaces in the United States, as far as we know. Um, it is something that I think we're getting more information the longer it's here. And there's also the debate of what it's feeding on, whether it's a host or whether it's just there. So I'm, that might come up as a question later also. Um, it's a phloem feeder, so it has mouth parts that, can, that it pushes into this issue right down into the phloem. And the phloem's part of the, the plumbing of the plant. So that's where the sap is. So if you think about tapping sap for maple syrup, that's what you would be tapping. And um, it's basically sugar water with some additional compounds in it, and that's what the insect is feeding on. And we'll talk about honeydew later, but it's feeding on that, and then it's basically all the parts of it that it doesn't want, largely water and more sugars, are going out the back end of the, of the insect to, to form honeydew. They are also swarm feeders. Some insects don't like being around other insects. They're competition. This one seems to be perfectly happy to be with all of its brothers and sisters, and you can tell when you see the pictures, it's very gregarious. It likes to hang out with everyone, all the other you know, spotted lanternflies. Next slide, please. So with the life cycle, and we have dates on here. Um, some of the dates were developed in Pennsylvania, and as most people who work with plants know that they're, they're, the month in one state or the one part of the state is not the same as the month anywhere else. So it, just to give you a general idea of when the different stages are present. So the eggs are laid in the fall and winter by the adults, and I'll show you pictures of, of the eggs coming up, but those are present from around October to around June, and then they start hatching, and they hatch into instars, uh, the first instar of the spotted lanternfly. And the first, second, and third instars are all black with white spots. Uh, and so you know some of the questions, you've seen the questions, you might know that's one you should pay attention to. So they're black with white spots for the first three instars. They're increasing in size as they mold from one instar to the next. Then the fourth instar is red or red and black with white spots. And the white spots are sort of indicative. Um, when you see there's some pictures of some other insects that it looks a bit like, you'll notice that that color combination is what really tells you it's a spotted lanternfly. 
And then um, from, that's from uh, July to September, more or less. And then in the, in the late summer and fall through the early winter, the adults are present. And then they lay eggs and it starts all over again. So next cycle, next, next cycle, next slide. <clears throat> so there's the, an adult laying eggs. And you can see on the right hand side, uh, there are groups of eggs, sort of eggs laid in little rows about an inch long, six to eight in a row. And there are multiple rows laid next to each other. And then they're covered by the females with a waxy secretion, um, something that the insect itself produces to protect those eggs to, because they're the overwintering stage. It has to be able to survive the winter. And we've looked to see if we can find some information on temperatures that they survive. The information that came out of Korea seems to be um, that they were killed between 9 and 25 Fahrenheit, but they've survived lower temperatures than that in Pennsylvania. So I don't think for us that's an accurate uh, killing temperature. What the, so the material that they use to cover the egg mass is, is sort of is whitish when they start, it turns kind of pinky, then kind of brown. And, and then as it, over, as it winters and weathers, it turns sort of grayish brown and sort of cracked. And it looks a lot like bark, uh, which makes it a good, good um, way to, to camouflage the eggs also. Next slide. So the, <clears throat> the first to third instars, there the, there's the first to third, in, third instar, white with black, black with white spots. I'm gonna get you confused, black with white spots. So the first instar is about an eighth of an inch long, and then by the third instar, they're about three quarters of an inch long. Um, sometimes they're they can get confused with ticks. We're used to looking at little black insects and thinking that they're ticks. Um, these you will find on tree trunks and in large numbers, which is unlike what a tick would normally do. And again, these are, they're good jumpers, they're plant hoppers, so they, they're all, that's how they move uh, predominantly, walking and then jumping. Next slide, please. There's the fourth in star, so whether it's black with red or red with black, but at any rate, it's got white spots. It's about three quarters of an inch long. And <clears throat> red coloring in, in insects is often an indication to predators that they're toxic or they don't taste good. <laughs> and that's thought to be true also in, in the spotted lanternfly and that they can pick up some of the toxins from Tree of Heaven and then um, pass those on to any predators. Next slide, please. So the adult, the picture that, that got spread around a lot is showing one with its wings open with that red coloring. But usually you see them with their wings folded over their back. So they're sort of more of a grayish color with black spots on the outer wings and then the red wings are hidden. Um, often insects will use red also as a startle uh, effect so that this insect would open up its wings to show the red if it was trying to scare something off. Um, but most commonly you see, you see them with the wings folded. Next slide, please. So I said these are piercing, these insects have piercing sucking mouth parts. Can you click again? Thank you. <laughs> um, you can see there the long mouth parts uh, that it uses to in, insert into the tree to be able to reach the phloem to, to suck the, the plant sap. Um, it's, it has very strong mouth parts, stronger than most plant hoppers that we see. Most of the plant hoppers you normally see are feeding on more tender tissue. This has strong enough mouth parts to actually push them into woody tissue. Um, there is not a strong pumping ability. Some insects have the ability to actually suck, pump and suck the fluid out of the plants. This one not so much, but it uses essentially the pressure of the sap in the phloem to push it into the mouth parts. Um, they can re re remove enough sap to actually cause stress to the plants or cause yellowing. And when you see the kinds of numbers that are feeding on a plant at any one time, you can understand that. And again, they're excreting the honeydew, so it's essentially water and sugars um, as they feed. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, here you can see some of the honeydew on the leaves, and so it looks kind of sticky and shiny, and that's true. We're used to sunny honeydew coming out of piercing, sucking mouth parts that insects like aphids, but not usually in this quantity. The other thing that happens is sooty mold will grow on the, on the honeydew. So you can see some black, um, black covering on the leaves and also on the trunk in the other picture. That's sooty mold that's growing on the sugars that are in the honeydew. And then also on, on the trunk, you can see some um, dripping that may come from feeding wounds where the sap is kind of running down the tree. Next slide. I think that's all for me. Does anyone have any questions? There is one question, uh, Betsy. 
the uh, cold tolerance that you got from Korea, was it 9 to 25 Fahrenheit? Or That's what I saw was 9 to 25 Fahrenheit, but right next to that information, it also said that they've survived colder temperatures in Pennsylvania. So we don't think for us that that's a good piece of information. And Betsy, there was mm -hmm. also, I saw some research that was done that the egg masses, which are the overwintering stage, um, they need cold temperatures of an average cold temperature of about seven degrees Fahrenheit or below um, during the winter to not be able to make it. So that's, it's got to be pretty cold. Um, okay. And as far as we know, there's nothing, there's not like a cold temperature required for them to hatch. Isn't that true? Or a period of cold? Right. Okay. Uh, so I just got a bunch for adults or eggs. Well, they overwinter as eggs, so that's the answer for that one. Yeah, they overwinter as eggs, yep. Are they vectors for any diseases? Not that no. we've seen. Right. Yep. Has anyone seen a relationship between spotted lanternfly and any ant species? I, I'm sure that ants are feeding on honeydew. We see that in lots of other insects, and so um, and what ants and wasps, anything that's looking for sugar source. Um, the, the spotted lantern fly is so big that I can't imagine that an ant is actually farming it the way it would an aphid. Um, Dan may have more information than I do, but um, I think those, the spotted lantern flies are so big that a little ant might get knocked off by one of them. Uh, so the next one uh, you can answer, there's a, is there a good systemic, which will, you will answer coming up. That's coming, yep. <laughs> And also information on dormant oil might be coming. Yeah. I don't think dormant oil actually works to kill the eggs. They're already covered with kind of a waxy substance, but Dan may have a better answer for that also. Does it need to be seven degrees for a specific number of days to kill the egg messes? I don't think we know the answer to that question. I don't think we know, but that I wouldn't be surprised if the answer wasn't yes, that you couldn't just have one short spot of, of seven and that would be enough. They seem to be amazingly tolerant. Yeah, I think um, Heather, at a, Heather Leach from Penn State at a meeting was saying it was 30 days. That okay. Not necessarily all in a row, but you would need at least that much. Thanks, Tim. Great, and I think we have uh, time for one more of those. One more question, uh, Nancy. That's it. Okay, all right, great. Well, then we will move on, so. Um, so, uh, Brian is going to be talking about pathways and spread. All right, yeah, let's talk about uh, where these guys are and how they might move around. So, if you look, this is the southeast corner of Pennsylvania, and right in the center there is Berks County with the yellow, and that's where these insects were identified in 2014. They probably came in in 2012 in a shipment of stone from Asia and uh, they spread. And so 2015 is represented in the orange color there. Moving on to the blue, you see they've spread in 2016 and in 2017, those counties have infestations and are in a quarantine area. Next slide. So uh, it's estimated that the spotted lantern fly can move about three to four miles a year on their own, which would be pretty reasonable. Unfortunately, uh, they're excellent hitchhikers. So the adults um, and the egg masses uh, can move around. Um, that's the most common life stage to move around. And the egg masses that you saw the pictures there previously can lay on all, almost any surface. So cars are not safe. Uh, they seem to like the texture of rusty metal, but any kind of plant material is also uh, a, a surface that they may lay their eggs. And um, there is a checklist here for, um, that you, we have a link to on the New York State IPM program to help uh, identify where you might see the spotted lanternfly and steps to prevent the movement. Next slide. All right, so they're not feeding on this tire, but this gives an idea on the potential of spread. And these are actually fourth instars. 
can see some on the tire there and on the piece of equipment. So um, in those areas in the quarantine zone, it's a, it's a serious problem to look for that these insects can move around and get outside of those quarantined areas. Here's where we are now as of January. And um, we talked about the area in the blue there, but uh, you can see there's some surrounding states that have uh, spotted lanternfly infestations as well. And the uh, yellowish color there represents places where adult spotted lanternflies have been found, but there's no current active uh, infestation. So we're always looking um, for these. They have been found, they've gotten out into some of the counties in interesting ways, but uh, as we mentioned, they are excellent hitchhikers. Next slide, please. So the most important host for the spotted lanternfly is the Alanthus, the tree of heaven, and it is widely distributed. It um, is one that just starts as a, a weed in many backyards and in open areas and we'll take a look at uh, ways to identify the tree of heaven. Next. So we, we can start here on the left and taking a look at those two circles there, it has these lobes at the base of its leaflets. And those are characteristic for the tree of heaven uh, leaves. Also these leaves are entire, they're not uh, serrated like many other tree species. Looking below, you can see a whole leaf there that may be three, even four feet long with all the leaflets on there. It can have up to 40 leaflets on it. Uh, and that could be similar to sumac or black walnut that can grow in similar areas. But again, those lobes at the base of the leaflets are a distinguishing feature for the tree of heaven. On the right there in the center, you can see the bark which is always relatively smooth. It doesn't have the deep furrows you would expect with a larger tree. And um, it has been compared to the surface of uh, a cantaloupe. So it has some texture to it, but uh, never, never deeply furrowed. And then the seed heads, there are male and female trees. And the female trees will hold the seed heads above their foliage. And those are visible even in the winter and uh, it does produce a lot of seeds and that's how it self seeds and spreads around. It also, if a tree is cut down, it will grow up from the roots. So it can be a challenge to uh, control once it's established in an area. Next slide. And it is widespread throughout uh, the United States. And we know this is one species that um, the spotted lanternfly can complete its life cycle on. Research is underway to see if it's required um, to have the a tree of heaven for the spotted lanternfly to complete its life cycle. Next slide. So um, in New York, we're really concerned about grapes. Um, in Pennsylvania, there have been some big losses in vineyards due to the spotted lanternfly. Apples and hops are also crops that we're concerned about. In the ornamentals, it will cause some feeding, as you saw in um, some of the pictures, it um, can um, cause some stress to ornamental trees. We're concerned about the lumber industry. It can be spread and has been spread around through Christmas trees. Um, in residential um, areas, shade trees, it can create quite a nuisance in a landscape. And it does have its preferences, even within a genus such as Acer for the maples. It uh, favors the silver maple over the red maple, and it, you're less likely to see it on the sugar maple, although it is possible. And it, it can impact the quality of life, and it sure has done that in the areas of Pennsylvania where it is established. And you can take a look at that tree trunk there, pretty dramatic. And with all of those spotted lanternflies there releasing uh, their honeydew sooty mold, that fungus that grows on that sugary substance, 
builds up. And on these steps here on the left, you can see the upper two have not been cleaned off and they have the honeydew and sooty mold on there. It's cleaned off on the lower one so you can get a before and after perspective of it there. Questions for this part? Uh, I have one comment that says the life cycle can be completed without feeding on Tree of Heaven. David Anderson said that. I'm not sure how he knows that. Uh, so just passing it along. Okay. For, uh, any Good. idea how long it may be before we know either way whether spotted lanternflies requires Ilanthus to produce viable eggs? That's the next question. Um, Tim, if, if you can weigh in on that, I know uh, there's a lot of funding that is being put towards the spotted lanternfly research. And yeah, I think some of the, it's hard to rear in the lab. So it, um, it sounds like it's a slow process. I know Tim is uh, tied into that a little bit better and maybe you can fill us in, Tim, on when yep, they I, may know. Yeah, you hit the high points there, Brian. They're still not sure. There seems to be two camps, one that says it doesn't, one that says it does or might. Um, and it's the problem they're running into is that even though they are prolific out in nature, it's very difficult to establish a colony to run the tests on. So they have actually looked at spotted lanternfly um, life studies to see if they can go from egg to laying viable eggs on a number of species. But unfortunately, they get to either the fourth end star or adult stage and then they die. So on everything, even tree of heaven. So they're still working on that. I don't think there's a definitive answer that we can give you. Uh, so I have a question about Ilanthus. You say zone four to eight, but they're, you know, they're well up into Maine and Canada and that's well below zone four. So can you, one, one of you comment on that? Yeah, uh, go ahead. Go ahead, Brian. I was just gonna say, yeah, portions of Maine have um, zones in threes in zone three, but uh, along the coastline, I think it is a little warmer. I am not sure exactly uh, within those states where you may see Atlantis, but uh, it definitely can occur in that as the map indicated. But looking at that Ed maps, I would agree with you, Nancy. I think that zone four has got to, it's got to be lower than zone four from some of the locations that they found it. I have, I have time, do you have time for a couple more? Yes. Sure. Does the insect gather mostly in shaded areas? Tim was in the zone in Pennsylvania. What do you think, Tim? I think it gathers wherever it has an opportunity mm -hmm. to feed. And then um, when it is in the egg laying stage, it is typically in what I saw was a lot of getting into the residential trees and that. And they say it likes to lay its eggs on the underside of things. So I think that might be where some of the shady area um, has come into discussion. But I don't think it necessarily has to be in a shady area. Is the primary host in Asia the tree of heaven as well? That's a great question. I don't know if I've ever seen the answer to that. I don't know either. You gave me something to look up. It, it has been a problem on, um, this is Dan Gilman, it's been a problem on landscape trees, roadside trees, uh, not, not just Alanthus, like crab apple, um, in and grapes as well. It's been a, a pest in grapes in, in, in South Korea. In South Korea. We'll take one more question before we move on. I'm answering the rest of them. Okay, great. I can, I can answer the question about the, someone asked about the growing degree days, or sorry, about phenology for when the eggs hatch. And I, I can't find exact information, but it should be around the time of Japanese quince, Sostra magnolia, or Japanese flowering cherry. That's sort of a, an indicator for maybe the beginning of egg hatch. Uh, uh, just to get one more, what about impacts in natural areas here in the US, native species? That's actually where they first found it in um, Pennsylvania, in Berks County, was out in a wooded area. And so I think that even though we're finding them and as they move out of the quarantine zones, they're finding them in different areas, a lot of times residential or in cities and that, it is not 
hard to imagine that somebody will drive up to go see a winery or to fish or hunt in different states. And if they're coming from the quarantine zone, they could definitely take a um, hitchhiker along with them and it could get established in an area that we do not see. And as we've shown, it likes a lot of ornamentals, a lot of shade trees. So it's one of the reasons we're having these webinars is to get the word out so people know how to properly identify them. So if you're going for a walk in the woods, keep your eyes out. And as far as I know, as far as the impact, it's not uh, killing our native or landscape trees, but it is, in some cases, it can weaken them. And of course, a weakened tree can be more susceptible to other diseases and insects. Terrific. All right, well, we're now going to move on to monitoring and management, and Dan is going to lead us through that. Okay, thank you, Yana. Um, and as you've heard, this insect can be a problem for a number of reasons, just the sheer annoyance of large numbers of them. Uh, a lot of honeydew uh, dripping on cars and objects and things below, uh, followed by the sooty mold that makes the plants or other objects uh, look pretty uh, objectionable. Um, there can be some damage or decline to landscape plants, and they're not confined just to woody, shrubs and trees, but they have also been seen on herbaceous plants, things like basil, um, soybeans are occasionally uh, fat upon, although we don't hear so much about them being uh, damaged, uh, but just that they can be used as hosts. Um, of course, in the nursery trade and greenhouse trade, there's concern because uh, the eggs are laid, as you've heard, on almost anything, and uh, they can be moved around on plant material and other horticultural objects like stone. Uh, even adults will fly into tractor trailer uh, cabins and other areas, and uh, they've been found wrapped up in plastic on uh, pallets of fertilizer. Uh, the adults have been found in uh, Christmas trees dead at the end of the fall, because they don't live through the winter uh, and survive the cold. Also, eggs have been moved on Christmas trees as well, so there's concern about um, transport of them. Also, uh, if they do get here, there will be restrictions on movement of, uh, of horticultural materials, uh, supplies, and plants just because of that. Um, management is really needs to be an integrated approach with spider lanternfly, and we're putting the piece together still, but here's some of the elements. Uh, part of it is public education that we're doing right now. Uh, monitoring detection. Now we know Elanthus is an especially favored host, so that is certainly one that we all can keep our eyes on to watch for this. That'll probably be one of the first places it's seen, and it does move on nursery stock and in vehicles, uh, and as you heard, we'll lay eggs on almost anything. Uh, there are non-insecticide strategies we also we like to look at, just physically moving eggs, uh, dealing with Elanthus in different ways. There's research on biologic control, and there's insecticides, and how we approach the insecticides may, de may depend upon whether we're in an eradication mode or we're living with them and uh, just surviving with them. Uh, next slide, please. As you've heard, there are other things that look like spotted lanternfly at different stages, um, and there's a few of them right here. These are three stink bug nymphs that are also arboreal or can be, and uh, you might find these on the same trees that you would see spotted lanternfly nymphs, and they're easily obviously mistaken for them. Um, and because they sort of have a tick-like shape, some people can think they are, look a lot like ticks. Of course, ticks will be found almost exclusively on the ground or close to it, um, whereas spotted lanternfly, while well, you might find some down there, they really will want to be uh, up above, probably on shrubs or trees, occasionally on herbaceous plants too. Um, there are some moths that look quite a bit like spotted lanternfly, and if you have any uh, suspicions, you can send us photos uh, or to a, a website, we'll give you a, a, an email address, we'll give you in a little bit here. Next slide. One thing that also helps when you're trying to monitor for spotted lanternflies is to keep in mind what stages are present at different times of the year and the level of risk that that might pose. So this gives you a chart up above telling you when the eggs are gonna be present, the nymphs and the adults. Uh, obviously the adults are the most mobile, uh, at least flight-wise, and they're gonna be present from late July uh, into uh, late fall or so. They will die with the cold weather and there's only one generation a year. The eggs are another major concern because they, although they're not mobile by themselves, they can certainly move on any kind of objects that they're laid on and you can see how, what a long period they're present for, as well as they're um, gonna be uh, possibly on plants when they're going to be moving in the springtime. Uh, so that's one reason we're concerned about them. And um, 
a lot of the pictures you see in the discussions about spot or lantern fly, fly really focus on the adults and they're showy and they're big and they're obvious. But I think it's important to focus on the nymphs as well because they will be present for a long time during the summer when we're looking. Next slide, please. Uh, you've heard about some of these signs or symptoms for spot or lanternfly. These are all things to take a closer look at. If you see them, um, you see the sheer numbers of lanternflies on the right, but notice the streaking on the bark from the sap as they feed. That's been noted uh, several times by uh, folks in Pennsylvania that are dealing with spot or lanternfly. And there's some uh, foamy material at the bottom that collects from their feeding as well. The sodium mold that's obvious, is really obvious there. I can't think of anything else in Atlantis that would do that. Uh, there's no aphids that would cause that. There's not many scale insects that like Elanthus that much that would do that, that I see. Um, so look for the city mold and on that host would be a clear sign. And if you get that much, you're probably dealing with a fairly good population too. On the left is a tree that's been infested and is uh, experiencing some stress and decline from heavy uh, levels of infestation. And so this will be a concern uh, on landscape plants, possibly in nurseries as well, if we get high populations of spider lanternfly. Next slide, please. Um, dealing, in, dealing with spot and lanternfly management really, really needs to start at the be very beginning of the chain. And here is a uh, shipping depot in South Korea where they're sending out uh, pairs for uh, this country. And there was a USDA APHIS inspector there looking for spot and lanternfly and other things in this area. So we have the, the great risk of sending invasive species here this route and they have taken advantage of that, but uh, we do have inspectors, uh, USDA um, there that are handling this. We also have uh, folks uh, stateside that are handling it when material comes here at ports of entry as well as departments of agriculture that uh, address that um, in, within the state as well. Uh, next slide, please. Um, there's monitoring being done for this uh, to hopefully keep it out of New York or detect it early when it, if it does arrive here. On the left is a picture of a truck that was uh, stopped at the border with Pennsylvania as it coming into New York. And you can just make out a lanternfly that's plastered against the radiator there. So it's very clear that they can use and do use this mode of transport to get around. Uh, the center is a, is a twig. You can see how easily something like that could be transported. And on the left, there's concrete and stone where Obviously, lanternflies can be moving as well. Uh, they'll lay it on eggs, rusty metal, um, and you've seen some other pictures that give you ideas how they get around. Next slide, please. Uh, there, these are traps. This is a, a sticky band that's placed around the tree. It takes advantage of their behavior that they like the nymphs and adults like to move up and down the tree trunk and they will get trapped in the sticky material as you'll see on the left there. Um, so these are used especially on Elanthus, their favorite host, to help in detecting them. Uh, the issue is that there's a lot of bycatch. There's other things that can be trapped on this. You can put a cage of uh, poultry wire, poultry netting around this to keep out things, uh, larger things than animals that you don't want to be trapped into the uh, sticky, sticky material. So they're passive. They don't use any other chemical or attractant or bait, just the sticky material alone. Next slide, please. Uh, one way of non-chemical control, or at least uh, not insecticide anyway, is to just scrape off eggs into a bag with rubbing alcohol. The alcohol will kill them um, and uh, it does work quite well. Next slide. Um, more promising, I think, is biological control. That is probably where our hope lies for the future here. One of the things that was good to see is this tiny wasp, which is already introduced to this country to control gypsy moth, has shifted a little bit over to spotter and lanternfly in Pennsylvania, and they've been finding it attacking eggs in, in, uh, in Pennsylvania. Uh, not at a great level, but there is possibly a chance that it will expand its interest in this host and maybe become a more effective control agent. Next slide, please. This is even more well adapted, this little wasp up on the upper left. This is in Asia and it is, has been found parasitizing um, high numbers of egg masses and a high level of eggs, relatively speaking. Um, in Asia and it's been brought to this country and now is in quarantine. On the right hand side you can see a spotter and lanternfly egg mass where the covering has weathered off. There is a hole in one of the eggs where it's a slit where the lanternfly nymph has emerged but to the right you can see roundish holes that have been chewed through a lot of the eggs. This is from this particular um, parasitoid wasp is anastatus. So hopefully this will uh, come out of quarantine successfully and uh, it will get started to uh, getting control of uh, lanternfly. Next slide. Uh, 
There have been some other biological controls seen in the environment. A bovaria was found attacking nymphs and adults in Pennsylvania. And on the right, you can see an adult that has been infected and killed by bovaria. The uh, fungus called entomophaga that is, is killing uh, gypsy moth in areas where it's established as a related one that has been found attacking spider lanternflies. So we don't really know how well these will work or do they depend on very high densities of lanternflies or will they work under low densities? So a lot of that remains to be seen, but those are in study right now and we'll learn some more as time goes on. Next slide. There are insecticides that do work and some work extremely well. And this is a list, a preliminary list of them. Uh, there's a couple more to add. Uh, those are uh, Onyx Pro and Telstar S Select. Those now have two double E's as of last week in the state of New York. Um, there are very few things that are actually labeled for plant hoppers per se, but uh, a few things are and they're on this list here. We have uh, Transtect and Xylem, which have a 24C or special local need label as a bark spray for Elanthus only. And I'll mention how this is being used uh, in a moment. Uh, we have a couple of trunk injections. These are two double E labels, um, meaning that they are not labeled for plant hoppers or spotter lanternfly, except under the special new label that was added. And these are available at the NicePad uh, website. If you need to get a copy, you can let us know. Uh, there are a few of the imidacloprid materials and the bovine area products listed here that are labeled for plant hoppers. Some have foliar drench uses, some are just for foliar use. Um, and uh, uh, as I mentioned, we have Onyx Pro and uh, Telstar S Select that have two double E's. We'll be adding to this list uh, within, in the weeks to come, but this is a preliminary list to give you an idea that there are things labeled. Next slide, please. One of the ways that Transtect and Xylem are used in Pennsylvania is as, as trap trees because um, spider lanternfly is so extraordinarily attracted to Alanthus or Tree of Heaven. Uh, they will treat selected trees and remove 90% of the other trees, um, leaving only the treated trees and the adult lanternflies will be then flying to the um, xylem or transtech treated trees and uh, be killed by the treatment. So they're tr been pretty effective in areas where that's used to help reduce the population. It's not totally stopping it, but it is helping to suppress uh, considerably. And that strategy may be employed here if, if necessary, but, uh, but that's uh, one way we can take advantage of their vulnerabilities. Uh, next, next slide, please. Uh, there are things that are quite effective, as I've mentioned, and what I've shown here is the percent mortalities associated with uh, different insecticide. These are all foliar applications on peach, uh, but what I've done is I've named the insecticides by their active ingredients. So bifenthrin, of course, is Onyx Pro or Talstar. Carbaryl would be seven. Uh, Fenpropathin is uh, Tame. Thymothoxum is flagship. Dinotefuran, that would be the um, Transtector Xylem. Acevate is orthene, uh, and doxycarb is provon, decetamiprid is tristar. So there's, you can see a pretty high level of control of nymphs within just a couple of days of the application. Um, but note, note that uh, conserve, which is spinosad, um, did not work very well. Um, you got to some control, but not really a great level. Um, so uh, next slide. So after about a week and 14 days, it's interesting to see what kind of residual control you get, which may be important if you're dealing with continual re reinfestations. Say you have a lot of adults that are flying in from forest or other areas nearby, You'd, you really would appreciate some residual control so you don't have to make repeat applications. Um, this can work both ways, of course, uh, against the biocontrols um, as well as against the pests. But uh, just to show you that there are some materials that have a pretty strong level of um, residual activity seven and maybe even up to 14 days after application and others the re residual activity tapers off fairly quickly. Next slide. So if you spine spotted lanternfly, take a picture. If you can, collect a sample and uh, hold it. Uh, um, uh, you, if you need to, you can place it in an alcohol and get it to an extension uh, diagnostic lab. Uh, you can also send pictures and details to the uh, email address spotted lanternfly at dc.ny.gov shown here. And the New York DC has a page on spotted lanternfly that's shown there as well. That's next slide. And if you find it, uh, next, next slide after that. Um, okay. Uh, there is this website, stopslf.org. Um, and uh, you can check there for updates and information and uh, research news. And with that, do we have any questions? We do. We have, time. we have time probably for about two questions. And then I just want to let people know that the presenters have agreed to stay on beyond 
the length of the hour, so a little past the hour to answer all the questions um, because we have a large group of people here today, just to let you know. So don't be anxious that your question will get answered. Are they mobile when they swarm or fairly stationary? Are they mobile when they swarm? Um, <laughs> well, uh, maybe Tim or... Um, I think they, I think, yes, I, I mean, I think they, they swarm all the time, more or less. They, they travel in groups. So I think um, they go up and down the tree trunk as well, yeah, yeah. the limbs do during, during a day. So they're pretty mobile. And, in, and, uh, and so that's as, as nymphs and as adults, uh, I've seen pictures and videos and heard from the staff working in Pennsylvania that they, you know, they'll, you'll see these so-called swarms of adults flying around. I don't know if they're actually collectively moving as a group, but they seem to be in very, very high numbers. Um, so very mobile as adults indeed. What just got the double E rating within the last week? Um, there's two products, uh, Onyx Pro and Telstar S Select. These are not labeled for plant hoppers normally, but we have special labels that we had submitted to DEC and they have approved. So you can, can now use those two products for spotted lantern fly for all the labeled ornamentals on those, uh, on those, on those can, products. Can you send those names to me in the chat so I can answer the question to her? Yes, yeah, sure. Yep. Will damaging the egg covering kill the eggs or is full removal needed? I don't know the answer to that, and I don't know, maybe you want to weigh in, Tim, on that. Um, I've heard that they're pretty hard to control, uh, although I have not seen any data on control of the eggs, say, with a coating of oil or anything else. Um, are you aware of any, any research in that? No, I haven't seen where any insecticide or oil has been effective on the eggs, and I think um, full removal of the eggs would be needed to ensure that you got all the eggs because it seems like it is pretty tough to, um, it's not easy just to smash the egg mass and destroy it. All right, let's move on then and we can answer any remaining questions um, after the regulatory update by Ethan Angel. Thank you, uh, first slide there. There we go. Okay, so uh, the uh, response to spotted lanternfly here in New York State is a cooperative effort between New York State Department of Agriculture and Markets as well as New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. And there's a lot of, uh, a lot of folks uh, assisting in that effort. Um, I just want to make note of some of those folks today. Uh, New York State Department of Transportation, uh, New York State Office of Parks, Recreation, and Historic Preservation, uh, United States Department of Agriculture, uh, the Partnerships for Regional Invasive Species Management, which are also known as PRISMs, and of course, uh, the great folks at the New York State IPM program and, and also at uh, Cornell Cooperative Extension. Next slide. So we're going to be talking about quarantines, and you've heard this mentioned a couple times in the, in the uh, presentation today. What I want to uh, stress is that a quarantine is not a complete shutdown of materials coming out of that quarantine area. Uh, it's not like a health quarantine. Plant pest quarantines um, go to identify uh, what we consider articles or regulated articles um, that could move uh, the insect in question out of that designated area. And by seeking to regulate those, we can mitigate those risks. Uh, so we look at the commodities associated, uh, the other articles associated with the pest. But this particular pest is very difficult because it has so many things that it can move on. And so when we get further into the presentation, you'll see that the list of regulated articles is very long and lengthy. Next slide. So this, uh, this map you've seen before, um, what I wanna point out on this map is the quarantine areas. Um, so the areas in blue are under quarantine by New York State Department of Agriculture and Markets, specifically uh, part 142, exterior quarantine for spot and lanternfly. Um, we've done that to protect New York State and protect our growers and our economy here in New York. Um, but the areas outlined in red are quarantines placed by uh, those, state them, those states themselves. So they're interior quarantines. So in the case of Pennsylvania, you can see that red outline. That's the area that um, Pennsylvania has quarantined on themselves. And again, the same case over in New Jersey, you can see that red outline there. Um, down in Delaware, um, this map does need to be updated. Delaware just uh, announced their quarantine uh, last, the end of last week. And so that blue area in Delaware uh, needs to be updated. But 
Virginia does not have a quarantine in place on itself. And also Maryland has a has an infested area that's not shown on this map. And they also do not have a quarantine on themselves. Next slide. So this uh, is taken right out of New York State Agricultural Markets Regulation Part 142, defines the quarantine area. And the, and the important part about this is, is most people hear that, you know, well, Pennsylvania is under quarantine or New Jersey's under quarantine. It's not the entire state. It's the counties that are infested. And so we have to choose a geopolitical boundary to, to draw those lines and we choose county lines. And so in this slide, you can see clearly that it's only 13 counties in Pennsylvania and three in New Jersey and then those other counties listed in Delaware and Virginia. Um, as spotted lanternfly spreads, we'll obviously add to our quarantine, um, but it's just the counties, not the entire state. Next slide. As I mentioned earlier, we, 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 we seek to identify what we call regulated articles, and this is taken directly out of part 142. You can see 142.3 here identifies the regulated articles, and I've highlighted a couple things here that are important for everybody to know. Um, first and foremost, the spotted lanternfly itself in any of its life stages is a, is a regulated article. So simply moving the pest, which is easily done if you're not aware of it, um, it is, is a violation without proper cert certification. Um, Landscaping and other construction debris and waste remodeling uh, debris is also a, a possible uh, vector or possible uh, spread into New York. So we've chosen to regulate that as well. Um, packing material, this has been an issue for us. Uh, you saw those yellow counties listed packing material. Uh, pallets stored outside and it's included in packing material where they can get their eggs laid on. Uh, some of the uh, shrink wrap that goes around pallets of topsoil and mulch and fertilizer. They like to get up underneath that um, during the late fall when they're sluggish and it's cold out to get up in there to get warmed up. So packing material is a big issue. Plant material, um, we've seen it moved on plant material. So those of you that are ordering plant material either for landscape jobs or for retail sale or to line out your nurseries or, or, or cuttings to bring into your greenhouses, plant material should definitely be looked at and it's a regulated article. The other, the other big issue is outdoor household articles. So anything that's stored, stored outside where spotted lanternfly can lay its eggs on, grills, shovels, um, campers, boats, anything that sits outside that's exposed to spotted lanternfly uh, can be a vector for not only um, the adults and the nymphs, but also the eggs. And that's usually the biggest issue is the eggs. And then of course, we have the catch all down on the bottom there, which is any commodity that we think has been infested or harboring spotted lanternfly then becomes regulated. And that's at the discretion of the inspector at the time of inspection. So restrictions on movement of regulated articles, basically you need a certificate of inspection. Uh, don't get too hung up on the language. Um, you'll, you'll hear people talk about permits. Um, those do meet our needs and, and do fit within the definition of a certificate of inspection. You also have to have an accompanying way bill. Um, so if you get stopped along the side of the road, we know exactly where that material came from and where it's destined to and we can determine whether it, it, it needs to be regulated under this under this part. Um, and then for those traveling um, through the quarantine area from outside of the quarantine area, so let's say you're coming from North Carolina to New York, um, you have to move directly through the quarantine area, except for refueling and traffic conditions. You can't stop. If you stop to pick something up, you're then subject to the regulations and again, also need that way bill. Next slide. So uh, most commonly asked question, where do I get that permit? Where do I get that certificate of inspection? Um, the gold standard right now is what Pennsylvania has been putting in place, uh, which is their online uh, permitting system. Um, and simply go to uh, uh, Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture's website, which is listed there, um, and click on the spotted lanternfly link on the left side of the page, and then click on the quarantine box, and that'll get you into the permit training. There is an exam at the end, so you want to pay close attention to make sure that you don't fail the exam. Um, it is uh, it is set up for um, businesses, but the general public also does have to comply with the regulation, and there's some forms there that the general public can download. Um, and there is also reciprocity amongst the states. So if you're if you're a business in New Jersey and you're doing work in Pennsylvania and have the Pennsylvania permit, and you happen to be coming into New York too, we accept that. So, next slide. All right. <laughs> there you go. Uh, we are doing shipment inspection, so if you're receiving plant material in, two things you should be aware of. Any plant material that's shipped into New York State has to have a certificate of inspection. That's pursuant to Article 14. That's an old law that's in place to protect our growers and protect our agricultural economy. The other thing, too, is if you're, if you're bringing in uh, any kind of plant material or other products from the quarantine area, make sure you're looking for that 
a permit or certificate of inspection uh, and pay close attention to that material to inspect it for any signs and symptoms of spot and lantern fly. If you see that you have that or you don't have any of the permits or certificates that I indicated, please call us so that we can work with that grower that's out of state to get into compliance so they're not inadvertently vectoring spot and lantern fly. And the biggest take home message here is report it to us uh, and make sure that you're compliant with the, uh, the quarantines that are in place. And there's a great amount of resources at the New York State IPM uh, website. Great. Um, thank you. So um, we're going to um, answer the last remaining questions. But before we do that, we have some questions for you. And I uh, remember those questions we had in the beginning, the poll. We're going to bring that up again. And um, I would ask that you would go through and uh, answer the questions now you've heard the presentation. And uh, there's also a question in there about whether you'd like a certificate of completion. And uh, if you would, just check yes on that. And I will send you a link uh, later this afternoon, uh, possibly tomorrow, uh, with a link to um, a certificate of completion that you can uh, fill out and use uh, for CEUs. And uh, so we're just gonna give you a couple of minutes to do that, because I know it takes some time and uh, we'll let you know when we're going to close it up. And, and then Tim and um, Ethan are going to give you the correct answers to these questions. And same thing again, if you don't know the answer to any of them, you know, just make something up. It's, it's, no, it's not pressure, it's not a test, it's not an exam. It's uh, simply a poll for our records so that we can uh, see uh, how this is working for people and how we might make it better. Looks like some folks are having a hard time finding the survey questions. Do you see that question there? Huh. Um, so maybe if, uh, if some people are having trouble seeing it, maybe trying what Betsy suggested is uh, scrolling over until that bar appears for you, the black one, and try clicking on polling and seeing if it turns up for you. And um, I'd actually appreciate it if uh, people are having trouble, if they could try that and let us know if that works. And if it doesn't, we'll figure out another uh, work around um, uh, for the next time. And if you're having trouble and you wanted to get access to um, certificate of completion, please just email me. And uh, if you respond, I think, to the email that you got, it comes to me and I can make sure that you get that. All right. So we have 66% completion and uh, 67, there you go. And uh, so if we can just uh, close up uh, the poll and we'll share the results. There we go. And Tim, would you like to take us through, uh, through the answers? Sure. Again, it looks like um, most of you are very or extremely knowledgeable. Um, egg mass starts out white but ends up resembling a splotch of mud, which makes it very difficult to see on any number of surfaces. Um, what are the prime characteristics traits you would be looking for to identify the first three N stars? And again, very good. Um, black with white spots. And what makes the fourth N star easily identifiable from the first three? Um, the correct answer would probably be it's black red with white spots, but um, the fourth N star, it goes from black and white and there's quite a bit of red that's added to it. So it actually um, is mostly red with white spots and a little bit of black there. And what is the prime characteristic or trait you would be looking for to identify the adult spotted lanternfly? And again, almost everybody got that right. Um, luckily, it isn't two inches in length. It's about one inch long, which is way big enough. And the outer wings have black spots. Okay. And I will turn it over to Ethan. Okay. 
So uh, question seven, do growers need a permit or certificate of inspection to ship plants from the quarantine area? And, and almost everybody got that right. Great job. Yes, they do. Uh, is the general public regulated uh, by the spot and lantern fly quarantine? Yes, absolutely. So the general public uh, can just as easily vector it uh, into New York State or transport it into New York State as, uh, as businesses. So everybody is, is uh, subject to the regulation in the quarantine area. And that includes the general public. And then number nine, who regulates spotted lanternfly in New York State? So some of you listed New York State DEC here, and that's actually incorrect. New York State Department of Agriculture and Markets under Part 142 uh, has regulation there. Although DEC does uh, do some regulation on invasive species, they don't have any regulations on spotted lanternfly. The other question that some folks answered was uh, United States Department of Agriculture. And historically, we've seen USDA do some quarantines with us in the past, but they have chosen not to quarantine spotted lanternfly. So the only regulatory authority in New York on that one is, is Aga Markets right now. Perfect. Thanks. Okay, lovely. Thank you. So um, let's just uh, flip forward and um, answer any remaining questions that have come in. And Nancy, do we have questions? Oh, yes, we do. Okay. Uh, so no systematic that systemic that people can drench around the roots and the nymphs would take it in when they feed and die. Uh, this is Dan. Um, there are, yes, there was a systemic listed in there. It's an imidacloprid product, and this is not a homeowner use product. This would be a professional use material. We would probably need to get two double use for homeowner use products. I have to go through those yet to see if any of them have labeling um, for plant hoppers. And if they don't, we will need to get a 2 E label to allow people to drench their own plants with these consumer products. But for now, yes, we do have things that are labeled. What we don't actually have are data with imidacloprid, uh, um, Merit and some other related ones, showing how well they work as drenches. We do have data with that material as a spray we know that can work quite well, but we, I assume as a drench it would work, but we would like to see those data. We do know that Transtect and uh, Xylem are labeled, but those are only for um, Alanthus or Tria Heaven as a basal bark spray, and that would be a systemic use. Um, there's also Imajet as a, as a trunk injection that professionals can use too. I was just gonna put a note in too that when we talk about the two, two double E labels is to make sure that people know that they have to have a two double E in their, in their possession um, if they're going to use that and that um, looking at NYSPAD is a place to go find information on labels. Yeah, thank you. And that's that's the case. Yes, because these products don't have plant hoppers or spotted lanternfly already on the label, we have to come up with these special labels. They're called two double E's um, and you need to get a copy of that. You can print it off from that website, the NICEPAD website. Um, they will be listed there. And of course, we're talking about New York State pesticides. Of course, yes, yes. <laughs> I was going to say, because it's going to differ depending on the state, because in New York State, both the site and the pest need to be labeled. So for instance, um, if an insecticide is labeled for grapes, then it needs to have spotted lanternfly on it as well. Whereas in Pennsylvania, um, it only needs to have the site. So if it is labeled for an insect in grapes, you would be able to apply that for spotted lanternfly as well in a grape vineyard. Yeah, so you, of course, uh, much of my comments really pertain to New York, but you'd have to uh, refer to your own particular state where, or location where you are or country uh, as to what the regulations are concerning use of products for unlabeled pests. Yep. And definitely never use, uh, say, a, a, a food product on an unlabeled crop. Uh, so an anonymous comment says, I've seen efficac efficacy with soil applications of transect to attack the nymphs. Uh, yes, sure, that does work, it works quite well. Um, I, um, and I've seen that with, of course, on Anilanthus as a bark spray, but uh, uh, transect uh, is very, very mobile in the plant. And uh, I have also heard, at least heard that it does work quite well. But we uh, so can't use that in New York, in other states that would be an option. Uh, someone's asking about dead mounted or preserved insects for educational purposes. Are they regulated and how they could get them? So to my not. knowledge, they're not regulated. And yep. I don't know uh, if we could get some. Ethan? 
Yeah, so they are, they are not uh, regulated because they're not a life stage, they're dead at that point. Uh, as far as um, mounting goes, um, Cornell uh, is working on some resin casts for us, um, and they have quite a few done, so we're trying to get those out and ready, as well as the New York State DEC lab has been working on some resin casts as well in New York State. I don't know about the other states, I, I've seen some things done in terms of uh, Riker mounts and, and stuff in vials, but here in New York we're trying to do it uh, in resin casts because it is a soft-bodied insect and it preserves much better that way. So they should contact you? Oh yeah, they can contact me. That would be fine. Um, I can, do uh, you want me to post my email? They can find it online or I can post it here. Great. And that was Jen from Extension CCE. So if you get them out to all the counties, that'll help. Okay, great. Um, will New York State accept Department of Penn, Penn Department of Ag certifications? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. yeah, absolutely. Like I mentioned in the presentation, uh, if you're, if you have product coming out of Pennsylvania, um, first and foremost, to, to, to adhere to Pennsylvania's regulations, you'd have to have that permit. And um, secondarily, New York State would recognize that permit. We're not actually, New York State isn't issuing any permits. We put it onto the states that have the infestation. So it's going to come from those states. Uh, in the photos shown, it appears that adults cluster or gather at the lower trunk areas of the tree. Is this common or is it simply where you took your photos? I think it's where the photos were taken. Um, when I was down there, especially when populations get high, they'll be anywhere. Um, like Betsy said, the nymphs like to walk up and down the trees, um, but the adults tend to gather, but um, they aren't necessarily down low on the tree. Um, they can be all the way up the trunk, depending on population. What is New York State's policy on finding spotted lanternfly in an incoming shipment from a transport that has the proper paperwork? So it, two things there, proper paperwork is good, but if there's viable live spotted lanternfly there, uh, the directive we have received is to, re, is to reject that load and send it back to where it came from. If it's a dead spotted lanternfly, then it would be allowed to continue on to its destination. If it does not have the proper paperwork, but no spotted lanternfly is found, it would receive a warning. If it was its first offense, a second offense would possibly be a, a, a monetary penalty of some sort. It would be allowed to continue on. Only if there is an infestation or some sort of live spotted lanternfly would that load be rejected and sent back. Characteristic signs of damage to plants other than sooty black mold? Uh, this is Dan Gilrain. You can, uh, you maybe I went too quickly, but you saw there was a picture in my section of a tree showing yellowing and flagging branches. It looked like it was under drought stress. That's what I would look for. How effective is dormant oil? I don't know. Um, I don't believe there's any test, at least that I'm aware of, using oil on egg masses. Um, Oil has not tended to be the most effective thing for pests like this that are highly mobile and fairly large, but I also don't know of any data on that. Um, it would be good to see how well oil might work, it's sort of an organic option to control, say, nymphs or even adults. I don't, but I, I don't have that information. I don't think that's even known. Does the insect hit our native wild grape as well? Yeah, this is Tim Weigel and they have been found um, on the wooded edges feeding in the wild grapes as well as the cultivated grapes. Uh, and then a comment from Lori Jensen at the New Jersey Lands Nursery and Landscape Association. She says there uh, that entity, the New Jersey Landscape Association, has created PSA videos that provide basic info on spotted yeah. lantern fly and everyone is free to see them and they are in English and Spanish on YouTube and if you search for New Jersey Nursery and Landscape Association you will find them. Great. That's it. Lovely, thank you very very much. So um, with that I will uh, wrap up for us and um, I just want to mention a couple of things before we finish. We have a page on our website called Find a Colleague, and uh, the goal of this is to increase collaboration throughout the Northeast. 
So if you're interested in collaborating with someone on Spotted Lanternfly, for example, you could go in there and uh, put up a profile um, of who you are and your interests and uh, help you connect with other colleagues um, around the Northeast. And um, an archive of today's webinar recording will be available uh, by early next week. You can come back and watch it as often as you like and share the link with your friends. And uh, finally, I would like to just acknowledge uh, all the pre-work that goes on to do a webinar like this and funding sources. So uh, we are funded by uh, NIFR as part of USDA. We've also had speakers uh, who are part of Cornell Cooperative Extension, New York State Agricultural Markets, and New York State um, IPM, um, uh, New York State IPM. And, um, and uh, I want to thank all of the uh, presenters for uh, the expertise they've uh, developed over their careers and their education so that they can jump in and provide such a wonderful webinar um, on pretty short notice. And especially to acknowledge Tim uh, Weigel for uh, corralling people and uh, putting together this beautiful slide set. And uh, so, uh, a bow in honor and respect for, for all the work and, and expertise that has gone into this. If you have any questions remaining, please feel free to um, email them to me and I will forward them on to the presenters and hopefully you'll get a great answer. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your curiosity and your professionalism in uh, wanting to learn about this topic. And with that, I will end the uh, webinar today. Thank you.